This happened on July 18th, 1988. I was on a uh, river, the South Fork of the Payette River in, in central Idaho, on a whitewater rafting trip. So we pushed off into the river and uh, it only took a few minutes before we came to the part where it started getting pretty steep. And there was a large, I would say, automobile-sized boulder jutting up out of the water in the middle uh, that we were being drawn toward. Uh, the channel to the left was very steep and dangerous, and the and our uh, the guy who was at the back uh, with on the rudder said, uh, "This is going to be too rough. We probably won't make it. We need to paddle to the right, paddle hard." So he's screaming at us, of course, over the roar of this water that we need to paddle to the right. And we're paddling frantically, trying to get around the right side of this boulder. But what happens is, is the water brings us right in front of that boulder and we hit it. And the raft went perpendicular and the guys fell back, of course, and hit me and knocked me into the water. I was the only one that went in. And even at that moment, as I'm watching my feet I'm going in backwards. I'm watching my feet uh, uh, follow me uh, into uh, break the surface of the water. I'm thinking, wow, I'm going to own the bragging rights to going down staircase and nothing but a life jacket. So it took about five seconds more before I felt the force of that water to know that I was in real trouble because there was very little I could do uh, uh, to control what was happening to me. I was just growing weaker and weaker. And after the last one that I went through, which wasn't, you know, the last staircase, but the, the last waterfall was probably only three or four that I'd gone over. I was so beat up and so exhausted that I remember after being spit out of this bottom current and trying to get to the surface, I tried to raise my arms and I couldn't do it. I was spent. So I tried kicking my feet to see if I could kick my way to the surface, and I couldn't even manage that. And I knew at that point that I was going to die. I knew I wasn't going to make it. It was almost the next moment I felt, my, I felt myself leave my body. It was like it was a whoosh. And all of a sudden, I was somewhere where there's no violence, no pain, no struggle for air, no struggle for anything. It was this sort of amorphous, and I would call it sort of a grayish area. And I just, and I said to myself, what the hell just happened to me? And as soon as I said that, I sensed the, the presence of a being near me. And this being was communicating to me telepathically. Uh, and I, I don't know if that's the right term since we're not in a body, and presumably we don't have a brain. Uh, this this energy of ours, this spirit, or whatever we want we want to call it, communicated to me telepathically, saying, "Everything is okay. You are you are okay, and uh, I'm here to take care of you." And he uh, turned and uh, began to move away from me. And it, I, my sense of it was that this was a, a male uh, being and um, someone who cared about me and that I knew very well. We arrived at this place where I began to view my lifetime from three different aspects. I began to experience it or, or view the experience of it from my own viewpoint. I viewed it from this omniscient viewpoint and I viewed it from the viewpoint of everyone with whom I'd ever interacted. Okay. And this was simultaneous. And one of the most profound memories that came that I remember was early on when I was just a child, like about a four-year-old uh, kid. And uh, my brother, who was a year younger, came into the house. We lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire at the time where my father was stationed. And 
He said that the kid next door, who was, I think, five years old, had hit him and he came back crying. Well, the kid next door's name was John Atha. <laughs> and John Atha was a friend of mine. Uh, I remember sitting one day, sitting uh, on his chest in the front yard, uh, saying, say, Arthur, <laughs> say, Carr, you can do it. <laughs> any rate, uh, John Atha and I were buddies, but when I went outside and I saw him in his yard, uh, I was going to see what had happened, and I, and I was going to get a little retribution for my brother. And I saw this stick as I as I got on the lawn, and I grabbed it. And it was probably about a foot and a half, two feet long, and maybe big around as your thumb. And I ducked around the side of the house and waited for John Arthur to come around. And as he came around the corner, uh, you know, and you could tell he wanted to play, I whacked him over the head with a stick, and he immediately grabbed his head and started screaming and crying. And in this life review, I got to feel what he felt. I felt the blow of the stick. I felt the uh, the emotion. You know, the big change is here's my buddy. I'm gonna go play with him. And then, wow, he just whacked me hard with his stick. And it went on from there. And, and what a surprise that was, that I could feel what I had done to others. So, we moved on and I got I got married pretty early in my life and my wife and I were not nearly equipped to deal with how difficult uh, 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 getting along and trying to make a living you know we were I was in college and uh, and she had just graduated high school and uh you know the the things we did and said to each other were very painful and i was profoundly ashamed of some of my behavior toward her and i looked to my i'm going to say it was to my left my sense was to my left to to see the reaction to of, of this being to the way that i'd behaved and there was no judgment uh it was all about experience and uh, that's what we're, you know, that's what I was there for. And all I got instead was this, I'll call it a wave of unconditional love. And <clears throat> as I went through and completed that review of the years I'd lived at that point, all I felt was love, this overwhelming love. It's love like I don't think you, it's possible to experience on this planet. And I began to understand that it was the, actually the creative power of, of everything. And that I was actually, my sense was then I began to have all these questions. Why did this have to happen? Why did that have to happen during this life review? And as I asked these questions in my mind, reviewing my life, all the answers would pour into me. And every question that I asked, didn't matter what it was, was answered fully and completely and satisfactorily. And I knew that where I was and where we all are actually uh, was existing within the consciousness of what I will call God. And this God is this is this absolutely non-judgmental, loving being. And in our Western Christian concepts, we we view God as this old man who lives in heaven somewhere way up in the sky, somewhere above us. And uh, you know, that's a pretty good concept for somebody trying to understand God, I guess. And I think that may be why he is often referred to as our father. My experience was we're not apart from God. We're actually a part of God. We're these, these amazing loving beings who, as we come down to embody and we choose to do that to gain experience, uh, we forget that. 
because what would be the point if we had all the answers coming down here? It's about experience and learning and evolving. So I'm feeling amazingly great. It's like everything it's, it's, I'm having a great time getting all of my questions answered and, uh, but I, you know, I want to stay there. There was a sense that there was no such thing as there as right and wrong, but just cause and effect that, uh, we're just sort of here on a stage getting our experiences over there. There's no judgment. The only judgment that comes is the assessment of our own lives and what we want to perhaps avoid the next time, uh, which then um, brought up the aspect of reincarnation, that we're not here just once, that we're here to experience over and over and over again to, to get that evolution. So all of this was happening and it seemed like it was going on for a long time, for a period, a period of time. But then I was told, um, it's time for you to decide. You can either stay or you can go. The decision is yours. If you stay, however, you have, you have these agreements, contracts, if you will, with others that you embodied with at this time that you, you wanted to fulfill. And if you choose to stay, of course, those, uh, the remainder of those won't be fulfilled and you will need, you're going to want to reestablish those agreements, uh, in a future lifetime. And I thought, oh man, I, I don't want to go back, but I, I don't want to have to, you know, to me, it was like repeating a grade in school. So I said, okay, reluctantly, I said, I'll go back. And the moment I said that I was back in my body and I'm, 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 I'm through staircase. Now I'm at the bottom of it. I'm floating just underneath the water. I am, there is some consciousness that I'm there. In fact, I can even see my body. So I'm not sure I'm even in my body yet, but I see, uh, the guy in the kayak, his name is Breck. He's in his kayak and he's down there searching for me. The guys, the guys in the rafter downstream, maybe uh, 60, 70 yards. Uh, and they found a place to beach and they're all looking for me. And Breck sees me come, my orange life jacket come down through the water and he grabs me uh, and uh, he pulls me to the surface and starts yelling at me like, uh, start breathing, breathe, grab the rope loop on my kayak, I'll get you out of here. And I can hear him screaming this. And it's like, I remember trying to move to do this, but I couldn't make myself move for a moment or two until uh, I'm coming around and I'm trying to grab it was like I I would get my hand on that rope loop but I couldn't seem to hold on to it but eventually between him grabbing my life jacket and trying to get to the <laughs> trying to paddle to the side and me holding on at least momentarily to this rope loop we got to the uh, uh, over by the, the raft and there was kind of a sandy bar there and they pulled me up onto that bar and elevated my feet and uh, assessed that I was in shock and hypothermic and uh, semi-conscious uh, apparently I hadn't aspirated any or much of any water which was good but they covered me with what they had which was life jackets and I think they had a little tarp or something and tried to keep me warm and it was sunny. So that was in, in warm. And so that was helpful and, uh, didn't have any cell phones back then. So the only thing, the only choice we had at that point was to, they put me back in the bottom of the raft, uh, lying down. And we had, we had probably another couple hours to go where I rode down. I remember how painful it was because I was pretty much, I was pretty gashed up and bruised on my backside. So laying down, was not the most comfortable position, but I, I was conscious and I was alive and I could feel pain. So I was, uh, 
I was probably going to make it. Well, I just want to reiterate that you and everyone out there are loved profoundly, that you are a spiritual being here to have experiences. You wanted to come here and embody. You've probably done it many more times than, than you can recall. You're probably going to do it again and again. Um, and it's all about gaining experiences and growing as beings. And I'm not sure where this all heads, but your, your essence, your, your energy is divine. Let it guide you that way. Uh, I want to say, you know, uh, we all think that we live in perilous times. There's probably all times are probably considered perilous. Let the better angels of your nature guide you. They will guide you. Um, and, um, God bless you all. <laughs>